there and welcome to this presentation on vascular revision. Um, this is a course being made with the latest guidelines but um, make sure you check them and cross-reference afterwards because I can't guarantee everything in here is correct although I've tried to make it as correct as possible. So today we're going to cover the uh, key terminology, anatomy, risk factors and then get on to the meat of the topic which is intermittent claudication, critical limb ischemia, acute limb ischemia We'll then recap at the end with some cases and look at which other things you can do to complete your vascular revision. So key terminology, ABPI stands for Ankle Brachial Pressure Index. A normal value is 1. It's calculated by putting a blood pressure cuff on your uh, ankle around your calf um, and measuring the blood pressure there and then comparing that to the blood pressure in your arm. So a normal value is 1, meaning that the blood pressure in your ankle is the same as the value in your arm. If it's greater than 1.2, this implies calcification and is, is kind of a risk factor. For, well, it implies um, diabetes, which is a common cause of calcification. Um, if it's less than 0 0.8, then this implies vessel pathology because that means that the blood pressure in your legs is less than the blood pressure in your arms, um, which is an implication that the blood supply to your legs has a clot in it. Um, and then we're also going to mention Doppler scans, which is an ultrasound measuring the blood flow in the foot. Um, a little probe and it can detect whether the blood flow is monophasic, or biphasic or triphasic and in basic terminology monophasic is abnormal and implies a clot whereas bi and triphasic uh, tend to be normal. You can obviously google a little bit more about those if you want to. So the key anatomy, you have the aorta dividing into the two common iliac arteries, which then divide into the internal iliac artery that supplies the gluteal muscles and the external iliac. Uh, the external iliac uh, goes into the femoral artery at the inguinal canal, um, which then supplies the muscles of the thigh. At the uh, adductor hiatus, this then splits into the popliteal artery, um, which then goes down and splits again into the anterior tibial artery and the tibial trunk, uh, which then supply the calf. Um, and the anterior tibial artery goes on to form the dorsalis pedis, whereas the posterior tibial artery goes on to be palpated around by the uh, lateral malleolus. So in vascular, you have the rule of one down. So if you've got bilateral gluteal pain, then you're suspecting the pathology is, is one up from where the pain is, so in the aorta. Because um, obviously the, the, glute, uh, the glutes are supplied by the internal iliac artery. Um, but if you've got pain on both sides, then it has to be a common pathology between the two, and that is the aorta. If you've got unilateral gluteal pain, then you suspect the pathology is either in the internal iliac or the common iliac artery. If you've got thigh pain, you're suspecting the pathology is in the external iliac or the common iliac. If you've got calf pain, then again, the rule of one up, you're suspecting that it's in the popliteal artery. Um, and femoropopliteal disease is the most common site of atherosclerosis, particularly at the adductor hiatus. And then finally, if you've got loss of dorsalis pedis, you're suspecting anterior tibial disease. Similarly, if you've got loss of the posterior tibial uh, artery pulse, then you're suspecting posterior tibial disease. So risk factors, um, obviously you kind of know the risk factors for atherosclerosis. They're the common things, diabetes, smoking, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, being male and being obese. The really important thing that you want to assess in the history is how well controlled they are. Because a diabetic that's managed via their diet alone it will be very different to a type 2 diabetic that's gone through all the drugs and is now damaged on insulin, uh, managed on insulin. Similarly, someone that smokes three cigarettes a day compared to someone that's smoking 20 cigarettes a day, there's a large difference. So it's really important to qualify with all of these risk factors how well controlled they are. So now we're getting on to the kind of main content of the topic. So intermittent claudication. Um, is when you have an ABPI of between 0 0.5 and 0 0.8. This is the slow buildup of an atherosclerotic plaque in one of the vessels in the leg, um, and it presents as ischemia of the muscles on exercise. So that you have something called the claudication distance, which is the best objective marker of kind of the severity and the progression of the disease. So what this is, is you ask the patient, how far can you walk before you get this kind of ischemic pain in your calf or, or in, in your leg? Um, and then 
the length can be used as a measurement of the severity because if they could previously walk 200 yards, now they can only walk 50 yards, you can see the disease is progressing. And the closer that gets to zero, the closer you're getting towards um, the next stage of the disease. The most important thing to note with intermittent claudication is that there is no rest pain. Um, there's no pain when they rest there and it, it resolves um, on stopping the exercise after a few minutes. That's important because um, of the next stage of the disease, which we'll mention in a minute. So to manage intermittent claudication in, in the community, you basically start with aggressive lifestyle modification and management of the risk factors like we discussed earlier. So you really want to normalize blood pressure, blood glucose, weight, hypercholesterolemia. Um, if all of that is done and the, the, the problem still persists, you can do a supervised exercise program, which is basically um, building up the collateral uh, blood supply in the legs to ensure that um, even if there's a kind of a clot forming in one of the arteries, you can make some of the other arteries compensate and be a bit stronger. And you also want to do your Q risk, which um, because obviously if you're getting problems with the arteries in your legs, that's going to eventually cause problems with the arteries in, in your brain, in your, your heart and things like that. And you want to start them on cardioprotective drugs. So due to current guidelines, that's clopidogrel 75 milligrams and a statin. You tend to start them on 20 milligrams and then work them up to up to 80. So an important thing to note here is uh, I think people tend to think vascular disease and then think you give them stockings, which is correct for, for, for the uh, venous disease. However, it's really important before you give anyone with vascular disease compression stockings that you check their ABPI. Because obviously if you're putting compression stockings on someone with a low ABPI, meaning that the blood supply to their legs is already bad, it's going to make the condition a lot worse. So the next stage of the condition is called critical limb ischemia. This is when you have an ABPI between 0.3 and 0.5, and it has two other key diagnostic criteria. You have to have rest pain, so you get the pain when walking around, but when you lie down, the pain's still there. The pain can come on in bed um, late at night. And, and secondly, you need to have necrotic tissue. So this is in the form of gangrene, particularly of the toes, or of uh, arterial ulceration, again, particularly distally can also present with what you call a, a sunset foot. So this is chronic vasodilation of the vessels um, due to poor blood supply and trying to get as much blood there as possible presents with this kind of very red foot. Um, just an important thing to note with the gangrene, it can either be dry, which is kind of better and means it's not infected, or it can be wet, which is where it's kind of pussy and sloughy. Um, and wet gangrene is particularly bad in the toes because there's a high risk of osteomyelitis. So if you see wet gangrene, then they're going to need a longer, more intensive stay in hospital with aggressive treatment with antibiotics. And, and there's a much higher risk of amputation. Um, so critical limb ischemia will need to come into hospital to be treated. Um, and if it's a small segment disease after your CT angiogram, then you tend to do an angioplasty, which is where you put a small balloon into the artery, inflate it and get rid of the clot. Um, if it's a much larger segment of disease, for example, the entire of the femoral popliteal vessel, uh, then you might need to do a bypass. And then the third kind of disease, which you shouldn't see as a progression of the previous two, um, because it's a completely different pathology, is acute limb ischemia. So we've discussed intermittent claudication and critical limb ischemia, where there was the slow buildup of an increasing thrombus in the vessels, and it comes on over a long period of time. Acute limb ischemia, ischemia is when you get a sudden onset ABPI of less than 0.3, and it's due to an embolus. Um, so it's a sudden onset of pain, and you'll have risk factors present, such as valvular disease, cancer, or, or AF, which um, are likely to throw off an embolus or a sudden clot. The uh, kind of textbook de definition of acute limb ischemia is the six P's. So pain, pale, pulseless, paralysis, paresthesia, and uh, kind of shoehorned in perishingly cold. So the most important ones to note in your clinical practice are pain, pulselessness, pallor, and, and cold are the first ones to appear. If you're getting to the stage where there's paralysis and paresthesia, that tends to mean that the leg is, is very late on and potentially not even salvageable. So you must do a CT angiogram um, to assess where the problem is, where the embolus is, before you do any intervention. Um, and this must be done rapidly as possible because this is a medical emergency. Obviously, if you've got a complete blockage of one of the arteries, then you're going to need really quick surgical intervention uh, via either an embolectomy or, or via thrombolysis, um, just because this is going to be 
causing complete ischemia and necrosis of the tissue downstream. People often require a prophylactic fasciotomy, which is um, you have a fascia surrounding your, the tissues in your calf, um, which can't expand. When your tissues in your calf are reperfused after an embolectomy, so the blood supply can reach them again, um, they're going to swell because of the inflammation and an Im all the inflammatory markers will then be leaking out into the bloodstream. Um, and these muscles are going to swell, but there's nowhere for them to go because of the, the tight fascia surrounding them. So this can give you compartment syndrome where the tissue becomes ischemic. To avoid this, what you need to do is, is do a fasciotomy, so cut the fascia to allow room for expansion. This can often be left open for a couple of days after the surgery. So now we're going to discuss some cases. So a patient presents with rest pain in their left calf after progressive intermittent claudication. What is the best investigation and what results do you expect? Number two, a patient presents with right calf pain when walking. They have multiple vascular risk factors and poor distal pulses. What are three important questions to ask them? Number three, you diagnose with patient with intermittent claudication in the community. How do you manage them? And number four, what are the six P's of acute limb ischemia and which of them come first? And if you're struggling with the answers to any of those questions, be sure to go back through the presentation um, and the answers are all there. So just to kind of summarize other things that you might want to research to complete your vascular revision, you want to look at ulcers, so arterial venous or um, neuropathic. You might want to look at subclavian steel syndrome, which is something that te textbooks and past medicine have, but perhaps it doesn't come up that much clinically and in exams. You definitely want to take a look at aortic dissection and aortic coarctation, carotid artery stenosis, which might be covered in your, your stroke revision, and then AAA, so um, not just the, the presentation, but also the diagnosis and, and the screening for that within um, the, the screening program within the UK. So thank you very much for watching. Leave any questions down below.